Join us today for the Occupy Provision Conference. Everything moves towards, everything moves towards occupation. And you never, you never benefit from something you don't occupy. You have to occupy. You can have a nice piece of land and if it's never occupied, you don't plant something on it. You can say you own it, but it's not really providing anything for you. So the benefit of anything happens during occupation. God has a place for you. He has a future for you. He already planned that. It's called a place of occupation, a place you're going to occupy on behalf of the kingdom of God. And I want to help you get there. Financial expert Gary Cassie began hosting the Provision Conference 15 years ago to bring entrepreneurs together to learn about God's kingdom and how it works. Registration is open for this year's conference, so sign up today. But just as a refresher, let's look at last year's Occupy Provision Conference on Fixing the Money Thing. God has a place for you. He has a future for you. He already planned that. It's called a place of occupation. A place you're going to occupy on behalf of the kingdom of God. And I want to help you get there.
computer. Activate warp speed. Computer on screen. Time space distortion imminent. Computer, move me within 2,000 meters directly in center of the anomaly. Now let's get a closer look at this thing. Computer. Warning. Warning. Warp drive. Computer, um, engage landing sequence. Landing sequence engaged. Vision one, this is amazing. Destiny is ready for occupation. That was 
awesome. Oh my goodness. Amazing. How do you even follow that? It's just, you know, it's amazing. Well, occupy. That's a term you don't hear much around churches, around the body of Christ. You don't, use, you don't hear that term. But it's a very important term that Jesus said, and so we're going to get into that. I'll be teaching out of my new book. I think it's one of the, uh, well, they're always very impactful, but I think this one is uh, very impactful as far as the video. You can see that everything moves towards, everything moves towards occupation. And you never, you never benefit from something you don't occupy. You have to occupy. You can have a nice piece of land, and if it's never occupied, you don't plant something on it. You can say you own it, but it's not really providing anything for you. So the benefit of anything happens during occupation. And so we'll talk about that. All right, so Israel in slavery in Egypt. Their dad's slaves, dad's slaves, dad's slaves, grandfathers, as far back as they can, generations, they think there's just slavery. The thought of freedom is so far removed from the possibility in their life, Egypt being the most powerful nation uh, militarily, economically at the time. Can you imagine what it would have felt like to watch the plagues come on Egypt, to watch the Red Sea splitting, and then to cross over and watch it wipe out your enemy that can never chase you again. And then also carrying with you all the, the Bible says loaded, uh, burdened with gold and silver that you are carrying for the first time that's yours. Oh, how would that feel? That is, uh, it's got to be amazing. And they sang and they danced and they had a wonderful time of celebration when they crossed the Red Sea and had that experience. But that was not the end. Many times we, we, we love to celebrate the deliverance. They were delivered out of Egypt. And uh, we'll come into church and we'll sing songs about freedom and we'll sing songs about deliverance and we'll sing songs about who we are. But... Uh, Israel came out of Egypt, they were delivered to go someplace. And so we, so we celebrate people being healed of uh, disease or cancer or delivered from uh, bondages and addictions. And uh, that's fantastic. But those things were only, only holding those people hostage from their destiny. They, we need to talk about where they're headed now, we need to understand deliverance is a viable ministry, of course, but what I'm saying is that we have to paint the picture of who they really are and what they really have, and so they'll move towards it, and that's destiny. Mistaking deliverance for the, the end instead of the beginning is a very common thing. We have to understand that everyone has a place called destiny, which is occupation in the earth realm on behalf of the kingdom of God that you're going to occupy, hold territory, hold uh, under the authority of the kingdom on behalf of the kingdom. You are called to, uh, your, your gifts and talents have already been given you to represent God in a certain sphere of influence. You, you can look at yourself, you already know you're different. I remember back, uh, as an example, back when we were broke and we had uh, involved in a car accident and they had a uh, settlement check. Now at the time, I've never, you know, we didn't have any money, but the settlement check was 23000 Now I was in sales and my sales were in those days, we went to people's houses and, you know, we we're always on the, on the road. And so they had these new Saturn vehicles. GM brought these Saturn vehicles to compete with the Japanese vehicles. Remember that? And that was the big, the big claim to fame. You know, we're going to compete with the Japanese small uh, Hondas and Toyotas and they brought these Saturns. And so I wanted one. And uh, I, I thought, man, I, got to, you know, I have $23,000, and they only cost $11,500 then for a brand new one. I'm going I'm to buy one. But what happened was, during those years we had no money, uh, we basically lived on borrowed money from whoever and whatever, every credit card. But my parents, during this parents, we'd borrow a lot of money from, you know, just to survive. We were... I mean, we were down 20 some, I don't know how many thousands of dollars. We'd survived on their money. And so I was going to go buy this Saturn. And I was ready to go out the door and buy it. And God said, oh, no, you don't. You see, a year earlier, my father 
had said to me that don't worry about paying me back. I'll just take it out of the estate. I'll put it in the will that, you know, this is to be deducted. I thought that was a great thing. You know, because it always, you know, the Bible says you become a slave when you're the borrower to the lender and it affects relationships. And I didn't like that feeling around my dad that I owed him money. And the fact that he said, okay, you know, let's just wipe the slate clean. I'll put it into the estate. And I, that, that was great. I thought, great, I'm free. You know, I mean, I, it was very generous. But I was ready to walk out and buy that car. And God said, whoa, no, you don't. See, my dad wasn't a believer. And he said, this is what God said. He says, every time he sees that car drive by his house, he'll think, there goes my money. I don't want him to think that. I want you to pay him back. But Lord, I just was going to go. I mean, that's probably 20 some thousand dollars. That's all I have. And, you know, we never had this before. And I need, I'd like to have the car. And he said, you pay your dad back first. So I called him. In those days, if I called my dad, the first thing he'd say is, how much do you need this time? That's what he'd say. And so I said, uh, oh, no, dad, I'm going to come and pay you back. And so I thought he was shocked. But I went to his house and we walked in, had my checkbook. And I said, dad, I'm here to pay you back. And he goes, well, that's 20, that's like 20 some thousand dollars. I said, just tell me the amount. I'm going to write you a check. And I could see my dad begin to tear up. He said, well, you know, he said, eh, some of that was a gift. Just write me a check for $10,000, we'll call it done. Well, <laughs> I had $23,000 <laughs> minus ten. We drove directly to the Saturn dealership and bought the car. <laughs> now, that car was the first car that I paid cash for in my life. And if I, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you got to put it in perspective where I came from. Nine years living hand to mouth, right? I mean, just surviving. And then I'm paying cash for a car. I loved it when they said, well, our finance department's over there. And I said, no, I'll write a check. It's such a great feeling. I mean, it felt like they must have felt like coming out of Egypt. I mean, it's just like, I can't even put it into words, you know. And uh, so anyway, it's a great car. I love that car. But what would you do if I invited you over and I said, hey, look at this great Saturn. And it sat in the driveway. I kept it polished up. Never drove it. Just, hey, I own this Saturn. Isn't that amazing? You would think that's kind of strange, wouldn't you? Because that Saturn is designed to take me places. It's not designed to look at and talk about and to, and to even though there's a great victory in that Saturn. There's a great victory in that provision that God gave me. The, the car is not designed just to be honored and worshiped as an idol. It was designed to take me places. And so in the same way, deliverance is the same way. It's a great story. It's a great deliverance. It's a great story of what God did. But that deliverance has a purpose to set you free to go somewhere. Go somewhere. I remember years ago, I, was, I had a dream. I was walking by this mountain it's, it's a stone, like a, just solid granite mountain. And it was the strangest thing. I thought I heard people, voices in the mountain. And I thought, well, that's strange. And I walked up to the mountain and put my ear up there. And sure enough, there was like a um, TV or something playing. And I yelled out. I said, hey, what's some, you know, someone in there? What's, can you hear me? And these people said, yeah, we're in here. They were in the mountain. And I, I said, well, you ought to come out of there. And they said, well, how do we get out of there? I said, you need to praise Jesus. And so they began to praise, and the rocks began to crack, and they fell down. And here was this family. They were inside this encaved room with no outlet, watching a black and white television just gathered around it. And they came out rubbing their eyes, looking around. And the Lord spoke to me in that dream and said, this is how my people are. There's a whole lot more they're not seeing. And they're putting up with a lot of things they don't have to. And so there's more, just like the video. There's more, right? Listen, friend, Colossians chapter 113 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and brought you out of that into the kingdom of the son he loves. Satan has no more claim on you. You can get out of that jail cell. It's been opened up a long time. Just get up and walk out. Jesus paid the price. God has a place for you. He has a future for you. He already planned that. 
It's called a place of occupation, a place you're going to occupy on behalf of the kingdom of God. And I want to help you get there. Now, I believe this book is vital, at least I think it is, to what I've learned and some things that will help you get there. But you need to understand this. So the title, let's talk about the word occupy. All right, we, It's in the Luke chapter 19, verse 11. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Now, a mina was a Greek monetary unit. It was worth uh, about 100 denarii or about four months wages. Now, the King James Version is how we normally hear this scripture. And it says, you know, he gave them money and said, occupy till I come. Now, he's going to Jerusalem to be crucified. He knows he's going to defeat Satan. And he's, this, is, this is talking about the period of time between his death and resurrection, and he comes back as the king. It's an analogy. It's a story. But in between that gap is the church age. And he is giving the church age a very distinct assignment to occupy. Now, can you define that? We have to define that. What does that mean? What are we to do? Now, I believe most of the church is ignorant to what that is talking about. I really do. Most people think when we say occupy, they're talking about conquering territory for God. That we're going to conquer. We're we're going to, you know, conquer and take the devil on, right? But listen, friend, the conquering's finished. It's already done. It's already finished. Jesus won the victory over the devil. He did not say to go conquer. He said to occupy. This is a completely different mindset than conquering. And we have to understand exactly what it means to be effective for the kingdom. Now, obviously, you can't ever occupy something you don't conquer. Right? We understand that. But he did that. Conquering is a completely different assignment. Now... If you think of conquering, you think of power. I'm going to conquer. I have power. I'm going to conquer, right? You're going to conquer. But occupation is less about power and more about delegated authority and administration. You'll have to understand those two terms before this event's over today. If you're going to occupy anything, either a business or anything in the earth realm or anything for God, you'll have to understand how authority operates, specifically delegated authority and administration. All right. For instance, a police officer. Now, a police officer is just a human, but he can stop a multi-ton truck by putting his hand up or saying stop. So does the truck have more power than he does? Well, of course. The truck could run him over. See, a police officer does not rule by power. He rules by authority. And we have to understand that.